Hello and welcome to the Sun Space Speaking Podcast. This is Chris Shelton, your host. Uh, welcome back. As you can see, we're going to jump right into it this week. So as you can see, I am joined this week by guest Phil Lord. And Phil is a legal professor, a law professor at, um, I'm sorry, what was the university again? Lakehead University. Lakehead University, that's right. And where in Canada is that? Thunder Bay in Ontario. Excellent. Okay. And how long have you been uh, teaching there? And what's your kind of, let's give everybody a little intro real fast on who you are, because you're a first-time guest for me. And you are also somebody that I recently, just just a few weeks ago, we did a... Um, uh, presentation together for the International Cultic Studies Association uh, about the RPF, Scientology's RPF program. So um, so that's where I first got to, you know, interact with you in a real significant way. And so I thought, let's do more. So I've, so I've got you on my podcast here. So tell everybody who you are and what, what, you've, what your credentials are. Sure. Um, so yeah, I, I, though I've been a longstanding fan, we've we've only um, spoken recently. Um, so I did my um, my law degree at McGill um, in 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 Canada. Um, then I I wrote um, the New York bar. I initially got a, a job in New York, um, then transferred back um, my my bar registration to Quebec, um, which is a Canadian province. I practice um, civil and commercial litigation, um, class actions as well, um, for about a year. Uh, then I, I went back to school to do my um, research master's also at McGill. Um, then I clerked at the federal court, which is a thing that, that people do um, to, to get experience essentially working with the judiciary. Um, and I've been a, um, a full-time law professor for um, just about a year now. Um, so I was, I was teaching um, as a lecturer before, um, but it, I, I've been doing this full-time for about a year. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you for all of that. And it sounds like you've had some, some experience. What, what sort of law do you specialize in or are most interested in? So my, my research is mostly about um, public law, so the government um, and then government programs, um, which also um, affects the, the way in which um, businesses behave um, and kind of incentives, which is related to my, my practice and my, my business experience as well. Um, and then new religious movements, which I've been um, interested in for um, many years longer than um, than the rest. It's not it's not the the majority of my of my research now, but it's still a pretty significant portion of it. Um, and mostly mostly Scientology, obviously, but looking at um, broader issues as well as to um, what we learn from Scientology, right? What Scientology tells us about um, the legal protections that we have, their consequences, how they can be used. Um, and how ultimately, right, we have um, systems of rules within religions and how these, right, interact or conflict with um, the rules that we have in the regular legal system. Got it. Got it. And there is quite a bit of conflict. I mean, if you if you look at, just to kind of get into this real fast, I mean, not, you know, uh, Scientology does have its own internal legal justice system, uh, it even has crimes and high crimes and misdemeanors and this whole this whole framework and apparatus of justice. And I have recently come to learn that, you know, while I grew up with and am very, very familiar with Scientology's framework, it, it seems to be the case that in America and, the, and Canada, um, these groups kind of are allowed an awful lot of latitude to sort of self-govern and self-regulate, self, uh, you know, uh, run their own little legal system within themselves when it comes to uh, religious discipline, I guess you could say. What, is that true? Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to speak more about any of what I'm about to say. But yeah, we have um, essentially constitutional protections which allow for um, for that, right, for essentially some level of autonomy or independence from um, the regular legal system. So 
it's essentially right the government wants the, the religions found to have the relevant status not um, intervening which allows for that kind of an internal um, system to exist Scientology is different as you mentioned because it is first much more um, expansive right it it's just big it, it covers everything there's lots of rules um which is somewhat unusual um, mm. so certainly it covers more ground and also as we saw um in in a number of, of court cases Scientology has been um actively using other kind of mechanisms within the, the legal system to expand that autonomy right so religious arbitration clauses for example um, so whatever we have that any other religion has, right, Scientology has been expanding that by using other tools like arbitration um, to get even less intervention from the government and the regular, um, the regular legal system. Usually that, um, that takes the form of excommunication, right? That's how it's kind of different from the regular legal system. So there, there is a way for rules to exist and to be applied. Um, but then if you don't respect them, what they do is kick you out, right? They don't get to do the other things that the, that the regular legal system does, like taking your money or, um, or your freedom, at least notionally, right? Um, and Scientology, again, is different in that it does not seem to always respect that. And that's kind of another way in which it, it pushes that um, constitutional autonomy that other religions have. Yeah, and this seems to be a fairly, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's, I think this is a deep well here, actually, because what you have is, if I understand this right, and this is something we haven't particularly explored very thoroughly on my channel before, but since, I've, you know, I want to, I want to talk about this is that is this idea of having this parallel justice system, like when you, when you join a religion, there is a set of rules and guidelines that follow with their dogma, right? You're allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do that. You're allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do that. No group can exist without certain boundaries, rules, guidelines. I mean, that's what defines, you know, how the group operates. And the courts apparently give religion an awful lot of leeway to enforce their rule set and belief set amongst a, a congregation of people or a group of people who, who they kind of, do I have it right, that the law sort of considers or assumes even that all the people in this group are willing, knowing, like informed consent, everything's above the boards here, and everybody who's in this group knows what's going on, and they fully agreed to it, and that's why it's kind of okay to have things that we might think border on abusive behavior that's okay, because they kind of agreed to it, and it's all part of the religious process, and we as the courts can't really dictate what you can and can't do in a religion. And, that, and it, at least it seems to come across this way. Would you like to, am I at all, am I off the, the board here? Is this kind of how it works? What, it, what, what, is, what can you say about this? Yeah, you're, you're generally right. Um, I mean, the it's kind of complicated for sure, but you, you, first you have the, the the constitutional protections, which just essentially allow for that, right? For for non intervention, which allows for kind of an equal um, autonomy on the other side of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, the yeah, that, perhaps the assumption is that people get into it voluntarily, um, but, but there's also, I guess, an assumption that. Um, we 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 have and that's true of most developed countries right we've made a decision as a society that um we will allow for things that might be wrong or abusive because that's the necessary cost of protecting religion which we think is very important right, right. um because the more ways that the government has to intervene that's more ways in which that can be misused um, in a way that would threaten the protection of religion, which we think is inherently extremely important, right? We think it's what it means to be in a developed country, that people can practice their religion because it's an important part of who they are, of, of, of finding um, 
meaning and happiness in life. And if they don't have that, right, um, it, it, they can't have a full life. Um, so the yes, there's certainly an underlying assumption that people get into it voluntarily, but there's also a conscious decision that um, even when that's not the case, it's it's the necessary cost of protecting religion um, in the way that we do. Oh, I the, see. So, so even where there is damage or harm or abuse, it's like, well, we 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 have to look at both sides of this and the greater good and all that kind of stuff. Because we have no way to 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 draw the to draw the line, right? Um, and and the the more we intervene, the more it can be misused. Um, and the assumption is that it eventually will be misused. Um, and that will kind of erode the protection of religious freedom. Right. So certainly there's a, there's a recognition that um, sometimes it, it creates situations that we'd want to avoid um, or that are, are abusive, um, but that we have no way really to prevent without questioning these choices. Right. In other words, it's kind of difficult to regulate this without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's a little hard to say, well, Scientology can't do this and this and this, because then that's going to step on the toes of other groups who are legit doing things that are not abusive, but this kind of regulation opens the door to stopping them from being able to practice just their chill, calm, non-abusive religion. Is that kind of the argument? Yeah, and that inevitably at some point, right, some government person or someone within you know, the government generally will um, will use the restrictions to the detriment of religions they don't like. Right. Um, and yeah. that's, you know, one of the claims is that it's more likely to be minority religion. Um, right. And that would inevitably question the whole framework that we have for protecting religion. I think that's generally the assumption. Yeah, yeah. And it seems to be true over time, right? Like it's as weird as it seems at first, the, the general idea um, seems to be right. There doesn't seem to be a way to be significantly more restrictive without, um, without imperiling that. Um, and everyone thinks it's wrong um, at first, but once you you look into it, it, it seems to be um, the best compromise that we have. Doesn't mean that in some other areas you can't step in, right? Like, doesn't mean you have to let them not pay taxes, for example, which is an entirely different issue. Doesn't mean you have to let them commit crimes. Doesn't mean you have to let them, right? All sorts of things you can regulate elsewhere in the law, right? Um, but generally when when people are claiming that they're not voluntarily part of a religion or that it's inherently abusive that's much trickier i think well and that's exactly the point because we have groups that practice their religion quote unquote but do so by basically engaging in coercive control and straight if not straight up physical and and mental or psychological abuse um and you know, and and this is a difficult thing because, you know, you want to have the right to believe that you are a, I don't know, you know, a degraded person before the Lord and shameful and, and not worthy. And, you know, your life is nothing without this meaningful thing. We want the power and the, 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 the uh, ability to to, to believe that, to practice that, to do that, yet <laughs> those of us who don't believe those things don't want to see such people beat on, hurt, insulted, abused because of those beliefs. We, we look at that and go, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Why would you, why would you give over to something like that? And then, of course, this is, if I even dare go here yet, but since, since we're talking about this, you know, then you have parents who may believe something like this, and then they start bringing up their kids to believe this. And then the kids 
start becoming abused with this, right? Flagellated and beat on and, you know, maybe locked in a cellar, this kind of thing that happens because of these beliefs. And so how do we draw the line between the right to believe? And, you know, it's like you said, it's complicated, but yet we cannot have a picture where, you know, kids are thrown in chain lockers in a ship or thrown in the basement being abused because their parents have a belief set. You know, we can't allow that to happen. So how do we draw these lines? Because clearly, if we give this group the right to believe what they want and practice what they want and have their own little legal system, we are clearly opening the door to this level of abuse too. So it's, you know, this is the, this is the big problem with this yeah right yeah and i'm sure we'll talk more about that but one of the lines we do draw is crimes which includes you know hitting people or whatever then there's a, a different question as to how or whether that gets applied because the nature of it is usually that people don't get the authorities involved which is how the law gets applied right, right. um even when they're out um but yeah, essentially, it's it, 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 it's inherently subjective most of the time, and it's all weird, right? Like most religious beliefs, it, it, some of them are are more widely accepted because they've been around longer, but they're not less weird, right? Like I don't know that um, you know someone getting pregnant without having sex or or resurrecting is is any less weird than Zenu, right? Um, exactly. Exactly. So, so you it, can't regulate the beliefs and we don't even want yeah. to. We don't even want to go there, right? Yeah. Yet you've got to look at the behavior. Yeah. And it feels like to me in this world that I'm in and watching all of this and learning all this stuff over all these years that there is an incredible back off on the part of the court systems and, the, and even police officers to even want to go there when it comes to trying to enforce the law uh, when it's in a religious context where, you know, there are gross human rights abuses or civil rights abuses, but hey, it was all done for religious purposes, so there's nothing we can do about it. Is It feels like a fairly constant refrain that we hear from law enforcement on this topic. Yeah, and, and it's, yeah, it, it's, a, it's complicated again, but you have First, you you do have the protections, right? Which means that that they don't intervene um, to to at least to some extent. Then you do have people, one way or the other, doing things kind of voluntarily, right? Whatever you call it, um, somehow they subject themselves to some stuff voluntarily. Then it gets extremely hard for the government to say otherwise, um, and that's the nature of it, right? Religion. It, even mainstream religions often impose very stringent rules on people, right? There's people who live without electricity, whatever it is, right? Um, then there's a question as to usually the, I think that the non-intervention is stronger within, in the individual relationship, right? So people doing things voluntarily, especially when it seems to be voluntary, it's hard for the government to intervene. It doesn't mean that from a more organizational standpoint that the government can intervene, right? If there's systematic or 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 um, executive mismanagement, quote unquote, or or abuse, mm. um, and then there's a whole different issue as to, as, as I alluded to earlier, how all of that gets applied, right? Because mm -hmm. there's also all sorts of things that are prohibited. Um, but at the end of the day, you rely on people to apply the law, right? So if you've got two people, even if it's not legal or consensual, um, and they don't complain about it, um, it's as though the rules didn't exist, right? right. Um, yeah. you, you have to have people call out the police or involve the court system, whatever it is. Um, and and usually they just don't do that. It's not even ever on their mind um, at any point, including when they leave. Right. Um, so that creates in some way some additional autonomy, even though it's not provided for in the legal system.
Well, exactly. And it's the sort of human effect of this that the cults count on, the narcissists count on, is the timidity, the the shame, the blame, the 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 gaslighting over issues like responsibility, you know, in Scientology. You're responsible for your condition. These are the kind of things that they have to indoctrinate you in because it's the only way that they can get away with abusing you so harshly is to first convince you it's not abuse, it's help, and then convince you that you need it so desperately and so badly that you actually should be doing anything you can for this and you are so incredibly lucky to be getting this. And they get you into this very different mindset and unfortunately, the psychology of that uh, hasn't really caught up with the court system a whole lot. You know, it seems that we are still operating in some ways. And I've made this complaint in other podcasts. I'm just kind of interested in your take on this. I, you know, I'm, I'm very obviously frustrated with the whole thing, but I understand the complexity of the issues. And, I, and I'm constantly putting this in front of my audience because I want them to get that this isn't some simple Simon thing where the FBI can just roll up to David Miscavige's house and start, you know, arresting people. It doesn't work that way. But, um, you know, this business of coercive control, of, of manipulation and gaslighting and the techniques that are used, which ultimately we call brainwashing or thought reform, if you want a better term. This is real stuff, and it really does mess with people's heads. So there's a problem with the law in that it tends to focus only on discrete, you know, sort of incidents that, that exist as a one-off. You know, you hit him. You stole this money. You did this one thing. When the, when, when the fact is that this kind of control and this kind of manipulation is an ongoing pattern. It's not a one-off thing that you can point to one incident and go, that was criminally wrong. But if you can point to a pattern of abuse, which is leading a person down a road to, uh, you know, to these abusive situations, the UK are the only people I know of who seem to be on top of trying to do something about this. But even that's only in a domestic violence sphere. Are you familiar with that? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So what's your take on this from your end as a, as a law professor, as far as like, should we be doing more of that? Should we, can we expand those ideas of, of this ongoing pattern of, of behavior that is, that, that, that is in the coercive control laws? Do you think there's a future there for us in terms of pursuing prosecution of cults that way rather than the, the rather hit and miss approach that's been used so far? Right. I don't, I, I don't know that it would. Well, first, there's a different kind of constitutional culture in the U.S. that would probably make it Im impossible to do that. To, uh, that's to, what to I'm afraid of, too. Things. Yeah, and that um, bothers me. But beyond that, it's just... It, it, it's essentially very hard to apply, um, especially for people who don't... Um, necessarily have the expertise to do it um, and i don't think there's a way to apply it that would that 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 wouldn't risk threatening the the protections that we have mm. um because there's always a level of subjectivity in, in, involved in that um and you're necessarily intervening in the the nature of the beliefs right um and that's that even if it weren't a legal problem, it would be a problem in itself, right? Because you have to evaluate rules that are essentially beliefs um, and draw a line. Um, and you have to have someone do that. Um, and I think that's inherently very, very tricky to right. do. Both so from a from how 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 difficult it is for the person doing it, but also how it, it can lead to um, that being misused um, or used more systematically, and, and there's a you know that there's a case to be made just because something is not a that does not lend itself to a legal solution doesn't mean it's it doesn't lend itself to a solution, right? Like that's a that's a good point, right? And 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 it's a it's a strong argument to be made, right? Like that that Scientology is a bad 
religion, right? That's one of the most, it's not the only one, it's one of the most um, salient examples, I think, right? Like the, it can be empowering though, in some way that, that you're responsible for everything that happened to you, but it can also be very, um, very dangerous. Um, and that is a, a claim as to, at the end of the day, the nature of the, the, the belief system or the or the rules, right? Um, and you're saying they're inherently bad or abusive. Um, and even though it's true, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that either the law should intervene or that there's a way for the law to intervene, mm. um, especially when you're essentially trying to save people from themselves and their own choices, right? Um, and the history that we've had with that has not been good when the governments tried to, to to save people from themselves, right? It's it's been very fraught with danger, um, I, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, we can look at Waco, for example, right? With yeah. The, uh, Branch Davidians and what happened there. That was an, that was an, an, a well-intentioned effort. And that's the most generous thing I can say yeah. <laughs> about what went down there because it was awful and it shouldn't have happened the way that it happened. And they were not listening to the experts when they were doing what they were doing down there. But um, yeah, that was not a that was not a good example of a government intervention. Well, it's a great it's a great example, though, right? Like what I'm what I'm referring to is not just you know the Soviet Union, right? It's these are recent examples that most people don't even recall, right? But that um, show how risky it is. Um, and and yeah, even even if you had people, I think, with the requisite expertise, I think it's inherently um, very difficult to do. Um, yeah. Well, they went down there because they had heard that they had been, there had been reports of um, stockpiling weapons and child abuse, right? Sexual child sexual abuse. Because um, if, if for to to kind of contextualize, this is this is the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas. This was in the '90s, I believe. Um, and yeah, maybe just a few years before. I don't know. It was Clinton, I think, right? Um, so around then, I think. Yeah. And um, they had set up, yeah, 1993. Uh, and this has been referred to as the Waco Massacre because a number of people ended up losing their lives uh, because of a fire that broke out and because of gunfire. And there was just this bad, awful confrontation. And if you want to look up the Waco siege, it's, you know, there's even a Wikipedia page about it. So there's a lot of information to be learned about that. But it was a tragic ending to a really bad intervention on the part of and i don't mean some intervention like they were trying to go in and change people's beliefs i mean they were trying to go in there and enforce the law and yeah. it just, and it just went south so quickly um because these people were locked up in a locked compound and there were kids in there and there were families in there and and this guy uh david koresh who ran it had absolute control this man was considered the messiah by his followers and he had very serious followers who had very big guns and they were absolutely willing to use them, and they they held off against the government, and uh, until it all went south, you know. And uh, that's definitely we do not want anything like that. People have proposed why doesn't that kind of why doesn't the government go in and do something, you know, with Scientology? And it's well because it might end up like that, you know. <laughs> and it it probably wouldn't work anyway, right? The the nature of the of of a strong belief system um is such that it it probably wouldn't work anyway right, right. like the, the the people would not you know change their mind and leave um and the 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 the, the religion or its its uh, you know organized form would not stop existing anyway right exactly um, exactly even if it's bad right it's it, there's always going to be a few people a hundred years from now who think it's a, who think it's it's brilliant, right? Um, exactly. And and who will adhere to it? Um, so that's probably a, a lost battle anyway. 
Exactly. Yeah, you really can't. You can't regulate the beliefs. That's that's the thing you can't do. You can't thought police. You can't you can't regulate belief. Um, and unfortunately, because unfortunately, whether you like it or not, whether you want it or not, people uh, around the world are going to believe stupid, crazy, nonsensical things every day of the week. It's going to happen, and there's not a damn thing any of us can do about that. What we can do is try to regulate behavior, at least make it so that it, we might, you can believe crazy things, but that doesn't mean you can do crazy things. And, um, but it's really even, but that, that crazy things is really quite controversial because, um, you know, one person's abuse is another person's pleasure. It's, it is a wild, wild thing. Cause you see over time, you see people like the Headleys or me or other ex-Scientologists, we were all in, we were fully there. We were a hundred percent on board. We absolutely would have fought and defended uh, you know, ruthlessly, our our religion, what we thought was our thing, and we, uh, you know, we went through years and years of abusive behavior, uh, abuse directed to us, abuse we dished out to other people, all because we were absolutely positively sure that we were doing the right thing. You know, until you until you change your mind and you're not, <laughs> you know, and yeah. you're like, oh shit, I've been doing the wrong thing for a real long time. Uh, so it's, yeah, it is, it's, it's, you know, so to base laws on that kind of subjectivity would clearly be a, a problem, be problematic. So how did you get interested in all of this in the first place? I'm curious. That's a, that's a good question. I, I, that I got asked, um, at first from, from people who were, um, giving me Scientology material and I didn't realize they were asking to see if I was a um, spy um, because I've never been in, um, in in any way really. I've just been obsessed with it since I was a, um, a teenager um, and um, I, I'm not sure why. It's just a, a Kind of like serial murderers, I guess, right? It's a, it's a, it's a phenomenon within society that is um, peculiar, right? It's it's odd, um, yep. and it calls upon, I think, significant aspects of the human experience, right? Faith abuse um what what people are willing to do why they believe stuff that seems weird um how the organization behaved versus what it believes right i think these are all things that that you know you can be inherently interested in that aren't directly related to scientology um so yeah that, that's what i i i so i i was very interested in the, the doctrine for for many years since i was a teenager then when i was in law school i wrote started writing on that um which is what got me into the job I have now, right? Like it's a thing that you, when you're in law school, the, the people with good grades are supposed to want to become law professors because it's very hard and apparently it's, you know, the prestigious thing to do. Um, and it, it wasn't my thing at all um, until I started writing on something I was interested in. Um, and, and I was kind of the first person to do that from a legal standpoint, which I thought was, both you know worrying and 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 interesting um and looking at the legal aspect um of it the 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 system of rules and then as i got more um you know sophisticated as a as a as a lawyer um or law professor really looking at how really starting to see how it can reveal very interesting stuff about how we protect religion more generally because it's a unique context right that you have a um, somewhat new religion that therefore had to fight for its legal statuses where people don't assume that it should have legal status right there's also all the history with regaining the status at a time when right they had to, to engage with the government then um, in a way that was a bit more um, negative, right? But since then, they continually have to, to keep engaging with the government because their their status keeps getting questioned. And so their strategies have changed. They've gotten more sophisticated, right? 
um, somewhat by necessity, as you know, because you can't attack, you know, tens of thousands of people. You can't have them followed at some point. You know, you can have billions of dollars. It just gets a bit tedious and expensive to try to harass, rape everyone that gets out or speaks out. Um, and so their strategies have gotten more sophisticated. And I think it's a very unique context um, where there isn't a, an analogous religion that can, that can teach us about that stuff. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's, well, Scientology is certainly a deep well, isn't it? Yeah. It's, I mean, it really is. It's not Heaven's Gate or a little lightweight thing. And I don't mean lightweight in terms of the ultimate consequences of Heaven's Gate were awful, uh, but it was so tiny. You know, and Scientology is not big, but my God, is it weighty in, in belief, in writings, in lectures, in the complexity of the system. Um, it's a half-assed system that's full of gaslighting and other nonsense, and it's just contradiction and double-bind central from a psychological perspective, but but just the sheer weight of it. I mean, if you were to stack up and look at all the books, all the materials, I mean, you're just like, my God, it would fill up, you know, a, a good chunk of this room. Hubbard had an incredible output over the And years. within what, like 20, 30 years, yeah, which I, is 50, extremely, yeah. Yeah, 36 years of, of, of right and Dianetic stuff. Yeah, Scientology. So, yeah, he came up with a lot of stuff. And it's also had an impact, right? It's not whatever you say about it. And regardless of the reason, right, whether it's the celebrities, whether it's the the, the harassment, whether it's the, the scandals on television, whether it's, um, you know, managing to intimidate the, the United States government, wh whatever it is, it's had a big impact on um on how we conceive of minority religions and and on culture generally, right. That's um, right. even if it's it's small, um, it's it's managed to to have an impact on society generally. I think. Yeah, absolutely, and it's and certainly the celebrity component has put it in front of more people's eyes. John Travolta, Tom Cruise, Kelly Preston, you know these these big celebrities or, or bigger celebrities, Chick Korea in the jazz world. I mean, the man was a, was a jazz god, but, you know, he was also a hardcore upper level Scientologist, right? So you have, you know, you have these very accomplished people who've been promoting it. And I think that's one of the reasons why it got bigger than it really ever should have yeah. or, or deserve to is because of that celebrity tie-in. And just the fact that you have, you know, a TV show by about a religion that has what twenty five thousand people, lots of which are Sea Org members, because the proportion, the relative proportion, seems to get bigger, right? As as as, as more public leaves, um, that that would be the subject of a TV show watched by millions of people, um, is, you know, if I were the one investing in that TV show, I wouldn't have made that bet, um, but that's how it turned out. That's right. Well, it's it's over. Uh, you could say it's uh, it's very, very representative of a class or group of organizations or activities that people get involved in, which we call destructive cults. It tends Scientology is even though it's not the biggest in terms of volume, that's you know, it is one of the biggest in terms of complexity, in terms of the sheer volume of of mechanisms of thought reform techniques that are being leveled against people. This has been commented on for years by cult experts that Scientology is one of the worst as far as the 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 depths to which it will take you or try to, you know, get into your head. Um, it's not a lightweight thing. It's a very totalist kind of activity. It, it, it consumes your entire life. And that's and by design, it's meant to do that, you know. So it's um, so in that so in that sense, it is uh, you know maybe um, you know it's got this public presence that is not representative of its size, but it is representative of its danger of it, of the threat that it presents. Yeah. Um, and which brings me to a question that I've never asked 
a lawyer or a law professor or attorney before uh, on this show, which is, okay, so re, so so we know from a legal standpoint and from a, you know, from, from a civic standpoint, religions have a right to exist. And in, in the United States, there, there was a, it's a constitutional right, right? It's, it's, it's part of the very fabric or DNA of our country that we let people believe what the hell they want. So it's not a matter then of trying to use the law to destroy or obliterate or annihilate Scientology and remove it from the face of the earth. That tends to be the attitude of people in our world, or you know, Scientology watchers or people who know about this tend to be like, how come we can't just annihilate this fucking thing, right? <laughs> But we can't. It has a right to exist, and like, uh, and, and if there's a more basic right, I don't know which one it would be. I mean, it's it, it, the right to exist is very, very, very fundamental. So we don't want to take that away. We don't want to. Re we don't want to modify our constitutions. We don't want to start regulating people's ability to believe things. But when you have a group, when you have a man, L. Ron Hubbard or David Miscavige. These are people who run these groups. They are they are you know the creators, the founders, the 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 embodiment of what this group is all about and the beneficiaries of all the goodies of the group. All the money and all the power go to those two guys. And you look at a setup like this and legally the law goes, well, here's all these people giving them their money, giving them their time, saying this is what they want. There's you know, what what are we supposed to do? You know, we can't do anything about that. So rather than framing the question around that, around how do we annihilate this thing, right? Let's let's move on past that concept because that's that seems to be the the, the undoable task, the Herculean, you know, can't be done. We keep talking about it, but it can't really be done. So instead, how do we, or how do you think, yeah, having analyzed this and studied this and looked at this for as long as you have, from the legal perspective, is there an avenue of approach to these groups where we can look at an L. Ron Hubbard or a David Miscavige and we can go, what you're doing is you are using this to commit criminal acts, to do bad things, to hurt people. That's what you're doing. You're taking this good thing and you're turning it into something really awful. Is there any mechanism or approach from a legal standpoint to do that, to, 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 to call them out that way? Right. Um, yeah, I think that's a good way to frame it. Um, okay. And I think it's not just right. Like I used to think that the the way you you put it, um, and I don't think it's because we brainwash people in law school, right? Certainly we do some of that. Um, you know, we make them paranoid um, about stuff, among other things, right? But uh, I don't think that includes um, these kinds of issues. I think it's actually when you start seeing that in context and how we protect important rights over time, right? Um, yeah, it's it's very hard to do um, to to have more um, intervention because of all these these kind of risks. Um, there's there's a again a strong argument to be made that Scientology is bad, um, but that gets into the belief system, right? Like if you say, and it's probably correct, right? Like the stuff about you're responsible for what happens to you, or um, you know, the, 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 the way in which the, the sex checks make you not think about stuff, right? It, that's, that's oh, yeah. inherently very, very bad and, and dangerous. Um, but that gets into, again, the belief system, right? Um, so the, the, um, the more, I think, promising way to intervene is, well, first, the, the criminal stuff is, is, illegal, right? You have to have someone complain about it, which is a different story. But um, So let me, actually, let me stop you real fast. Let me just sure. ask you a question real fast on that exact point, because this comes up often, and I always right. have to wonder to myself, wait a second. It's illegal to go beat on somebody, right? Yeah. Is it illegal to go beat on somebody 
under any context? Yes. Okay. And that's the that's the that's the short answer to it, okay. right? And and the nature of it is that the so when you commit a crime or you say you are the victim of a crime, you call up the police, not a lawyer, right? You call up the police and then the police gives that to a government lawyer who sues you and tries to put you in jail. That's the nature of the criminal process. So yep. if you've got someone suing someone else, it's not about the crime, okay? So that's a, a that's how it works. So people suing each other, even if they're alleging crimes, is not for these purposes necessarily. And oh, in other words, you're taught you're differentiating like a civil suit from a criminal. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Like like I could sue you for monetary damages, but I yeah. can't sue you for kidnapping me. Correct. Right. I, I mean, if I if I cost you money indirectly by kidnapping you, you could sue me. But that's not how we apply the criminal law. It's right. by a, a, a you calling up the police and then a government lawyer who doesn't charge the victim anything suing to put you in jail. Right. Um, and yes, all the criminal stuff is illegal. And, and generally, there is no consent to it. To, to simplify things. So okay. if someone hits you, it's assault, right? The nature yeah. of that is they are touching you without your consent, but usually there is a touching being the, the way in which it's defined, right? Um, but there's there's also a rule that says you cannot consent to that, mm. unless it's like a boxing match or something. But mm -hmm. even if you consent to being kidnapped, jail, or hit, the it doesn't count oh and that is okay. not something that religions can get away from it, it's it, the the criminal laws are not I'm, I'm oversimplifying things right on on a bunch of points there but essentially it's not something that they can get away from okay okay so um okay got it so one of the ways of course that you might get around this is to have a penitent, whether it's Catholic, Scientologist, whatever, uh, self-flagellate. <laughs> you know, so, I, you know, they punish, they hurt themselves, you know, but that's, that's, a, that's just a comment. So, um, okay. So they can't get away with that. If it's a criminal law, then they can't violate it no matter what the context. And then the challenge, of course, becomes notifying the police or notifying the authorities so that that can occur. Well, there, yeah, there's lots of challenges, right? Like, first, you have to have someone call the police, which does not happen, right. even when they're out. Because, um, you know, again, like the whole thing, the way in which the system works within a religion is that you get kicked out, right? So they don't, unlike the regular court system, they don't take your money or your freedom, they kick you out. Nonetheless, right? As you certainly know, that can be a lot more important than your freedom or your money, right? Like going to hell can be far more important and have you do anything um, that they want. And usually there, there's other consequences as well, right? Like this connection, um, which is not unique to Scientology, but that adds a big weight to these consequences, even if you no longer think you're actually losing your eternal salvation. So um, people don't usually complain. Then once they complain, you have to prove it, which is not that simple, right? Because the criminal law has the higher standard to prove it. And on top of that, right, why would you do that? It, it, even if it's true, right? Like, why would you take your time to go to the police, file a report, and then, you know, you're scared that someone will retaliate against you and then you're stuck in the system for three years having to testify you'll get your credibility tested because that's how it works and it's important right for it to work that way even if we we think it's it's it looks bad and and often affects people negatively right so you'll have people attacking your credibility it will be done in public um so it can be used against you forever um by your say your employers right your future employers um and then at the end of the day you get no money no no direct benefit for all of that being done 
Um, and chances are, it's not even going to work because the standard's so high. And um, so you've got all of these barriers that make it such that right, people don't do it. Usually, people you know are far more likely to sue um, to get money because then first it's easier, and second they get money, right? right. Um, so they get an actual benefit beyond seeing someone who did something wrong punished. Right. I, the only problem there, of course, being that you can go that route with Scientology, and certainly people have. We've seen a number of those cases since the 70s and 80s. But um, then the, 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 the system being the way that it is and the amount of money that these groups universally have, whether we're talking about the Moonies, Scientologists, JWs, so they bring their A-game legal team to bear against you. And, and unfortunately, because of the way the systems tend to be put together, um, you know, if you're a victim of one of these groups, you're generally not well uh, financed. And psychologically, of course, you're going to have to go through all this crap by yourself or with a small, you know, support system that you have. And um, yeah, so you don't even really have the money to do anything other than get a lawyer who can service your case on a retain you know on a on a on a uh what the percentage fee right they're going to make it yeah. and that's a class of lawyer that's only going to be able to do so much work so much research so much strategizing at least that's what we've seen what i mean am i wrong no it's mostly right um and i, I mean some of the stuff is less is better today right like you used to be, I, I, abuse of procedure doesn't really work anymore right like oh. you can have a very weak or bad legal claim and that doesn't make it abusive right like the line for it to be abusive is somewhat high right so uh, people can fight claims or bring claims that are very unlikely to, to to be meritorious and that doesn't make them abusive right but the actual abuse of procedure that, that Scientology used to do is no longer really permitted, right? Like they can't file a million useless motions. They can't find ways to drag on proceedings for years and years and years, right? Like, um, and they can't bring purely abusive claims to shut people up, right? Like the, uh. now there's, there's pretty strong protections against that, right? Like if they sue you personally for $10 million for defamation, Right. There are, which is usually how you try to intimidate people, right? You say they said something negative, it's back to your reputation, and you sue them for a humongous amount of money, right? That doesn't really work anymore because we have rules against that. Mm. Um, nonetheless, you do have to fund the lawsuit, right? Usually, as you mentioned, it would be someone on contingency, which would mean it would have to be, um, you know, lawyers who don't get paid by the hours by the hour aren't done right like they they take a case on contingency because they think they'll win um and so yeah they it has to be a, a large enough amount of money they have to think they'll win um and then the, as you mentioned i, I mean the, the lawyers to make the effort that they have to make pursuant to their professional obligations right but they, they don't necessarily put in additional time um if there is no direct incentive to do that right and 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 fighting scientology e even with the courts not putting up with nonsense it's still going to be a years long proposition yeah to take them on there is no swift and easy justice when it comes to this kind of activity it's it's going to be dragged it's out and it's going to be slow it's going to be painful yeah and they have good What's i mean I, they don't have they don't always have, um, they don't always plead the nature of the claim, right? Like they, they have very good lawyers who understand the constitutional protections. And usually that's what they invoke the most, right? They have excellent lawyers who understand the stringency and the nature of the protections. Um, and so you can fight, have a, bring a claim um, for anything financial um, but they always have, on the other side of that, among others, right, lawyers who know extremely well the nature of the constitutional protections and try to bound or, 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 or essentially defeat the claim um, with these 
constitutional protections, which aren't always the, the specialty of the lawyers who's bringing the claim. Yeah, exactly. I mean, plus they're not usually, these kind of lawsuits are not particularly passion projects for these lawyers. So they're not, you know, necessarily going the extra mile or, or even what I have found or what I, what I tend to see over and over again, unfortunately, is that they don't, don't tend to correctly estimate what they're taking on. Their initial filings are weak. You know, there's not a lot of evidence. They don't really understand the nature of the enemy, you know, and so they they tend to make a lot of, uh, you know, even rookie kind of mistakes in, in, in the beginning of their cases. And this sets them up for failure through the whole thing. And I'm looking at, like, say, you know, Valerie Haney right now, who, you know, there a lot more evidence was needed in those initial filings, you know. And it just wasn't there and you can't go back and redo it, you know, so you just, ah, so you kind of, it's a little frustrating watching this happen from time to time. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's generally true. not, I'm not saying that, that, that lawyers don't do their job correctly, but um, it's true that the, the way in which you, you bound the claim at first is very important um, and sometimes overlooked because that's the nature of it, right? Like if you're suing someone, they have to know what they're getting sued for. Yep. Um, and you can't just, just substantially change that halfway through. Um, yes. That's the, the general idea, right? Because then they don't really have a way to fully defend themselves if they, they it, it gets changed um, in the meantime. Uh, and certainly people who are not well-versed in this tend to over-interpret the result of a case, right? Like, just because they lose doesn't mean that... Um, <laughs> Scientology did nothing wrong and doesn't mean that you couldn't have, right, four other um, legal claims that could have been brought on the exact same fact. Right. Um, and I think conversely, Scientology is pretty good at doing the exact opposite, right? Um, like if you take the, the Headleys, for example, um, Scientology was very good from the start. It's seeing what the potential areas would be, areas of issues would be, right? Like first, the they were there voluntarily. So they got all the evidence at first and, and, and framed the claim in a way that would show that they were there voluntarily, that, that they did and could leave at some point, right? And therefore were able to leave. Also knew that, right, beyond that, they would claim the constitutional stuff, right? That everything was religious doctrine, the court couldn't interpret it, right? Um, which is the... It is how it works, but it's where it gets a bit bizarre, right? Because the court doesn't even get into it. So if Scientology is a rule that says, and it does, right? It says you get a refund. And then it interprets that rule as meaning you do not get a refund, even if it's clearly not a an, an issue that requires Scientology expertise. And even if it is clearly wrong, because clearly the rule is being applied as the exact opposite of what it says, the court doesn't intervene, right? Um, so they framed some issues that way, and they knew that the 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 physical protections would be a problem, right? Um, that the, the Headleys would claim that they were locked in, and so they had from the start this idea that um, you know you had um, very expensive cameras on on um, the gold base, I think, and therefore that. Uh, to protect these very expensive cameras and stuff, you had to have, um, you know, barbed wires and gates and security guards. Right. Um, and it worked, and especially because from the start, they knew that these would be the areas of potential um, vulnerability. Um, and they found ways to frame them as being justified right. by some other rationale. Yeah, exactly. Even though some of those rationales were, you know, just ridiculously stupid. It's it is frustrating. Um, but it's also frustrating to watch, you know, the 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 setup, not, you know, like the Headley case. I mean, it was just not well thought through from the get go. And so strategically, they were able to cut them off at the knees and get the whole thing dismissed before it even really got going. Um you know, and that's what happened, by the way, right? Like, there's a lot, there's lots to be said about that case, but as you mentioned, it was never actually fully tried. heard. Yeah, it, yeah. You know, never essentially did. It, it was, yeah. It, it's a mechanism that allows for it to be 
thrown out before it's fully heard. And that's what it was. Yeah, I mean, it was so poorly out. thought out, it didn't even get to trial, you know, but that, that's what I mean is it's like, it looked like, I mean, I am positive, this is no hit on the Headleys at all. They are amazingly good people. And they, and they worked really, really hard to make that work. It was just, it just strategically, it was just not the way to do it, you know? And, and, and perhaps in a way, you know, we, that had to happen in order to learn that, but you know, it's just, it, it, it results in a lack of what we might think of as justice for, you know, people who have been victimized by these groups. And um, when you're talking about now something like the Masterson case where real criminal charges are being brought to bear, I am, I, I am really would, I'm very curious about your take on what you would, do you have any predictions, any ideas, anything about what you think is going to happen? I think the case starts in August. It's scheduled for, I believe, four weeks is what I read Tony Ortega report. You mean the, the Masterson case? Or? Yeah, the Masterson's going well, there's to There's two separate for, components you know? there, right? Like the, the, again, like the criminal stuff is separate. So you get, a, you know, all, all the stuff I said, right? Like the police, the government lawyer, all of that. Um, the civil so, suit and the criminal suit. I guess I'm asking you about correct. the criminal. I'm asking you about the criminal. So, yeah, but that's important to yes. stress, right? Like the stuff that is potentially subject to religious arbitration is not him going to jail or not, right? Mm -hmm. It's just essentially a claim for money, which is entirely separate. Yep. Um, and the kind of speaking more generally that the nature of arbitration is that it's really hard to so the, first the nature of arbitration is you don't get to go to court right because you have essentially um a, a constitutional right to go to court right yep. um and so you have to have both people agree not to go to court um because they both have that right and they have to do that voluntarily and then that's why you get to have a non-judge decide on something instead of a court um, which, you know, there's all sorts of issues with that, but Scientology gets people to sign contracts, which are ostensibly voluntary because no one, especially, you know, they're, they're new believers, there's questions as to if everyone signs it and doesn't get treated, whether it's voluntary, but courts are saying it is. Um, so they sign a contract, subjects them to arbitration. Um, so the, the nature of it is that you don't get to go to court, nonetheless, if you think that something is not subject to arbitration, usually it's very hard to have determined by a court before you go to arbitration. Because there's rules that say, if you think, because there's limits to that, right? Like you, the piece of paper you sign that says you don't go to court, it's limits to what you don't get to go to court on. Um, and so if you are thinking that the stuff that you're complaining about is not within that, um, jurisdiction um, for obvious reasons, right? Because they're separate claims. If if you give the church money, you want your money back. That is essentially a contractual relationship, right? Mm -hmm. um, if the church harms you in a way that you did not foresee, generally that would not be subject necessarily to arbitration, which is where that gets complicated with the right criminal acts. Nonetheless, there's a rule that says again, generally, that you have to tell the arbitrator first. So the court won't be the one to say, this is the limit of what you agreed to as arbitration, therefore, you'll, you'll get to come to court. You have to tell the arbitrator that in the first place, right? To tell them, hey, you are beyond your, what we call jurisdiction, beyond what you have a right to rule on um, before you get the court to do that. And then if the arbitrator says, no, and they decide upon it, then you go back to court and the court says, right, if it was beyond jurisdiction. And it's also what happened in the Garcia case, right? So the fact that you try to go to court at first and they send you back to arbitration um, in itself just doesn't really mean much because that's how the system generally works. Um, you have to first tell the arbitrator that you think they don't have jurisdiction. So just because it's sent back to arbitration at first, um doesn't mean that the courts decided that it's not um that it's not going to eventually find that it's not something that can be subjected to arbitration it's just the 
order in which things have to happen. So you have to go to arbitration first, then it has to go wrong, or the arbitrator says they have jurisdiction, and then you get to go to court and try to have that um, right. reviewed. Right. And that would be where the Garcia case is now, if they chose to pursue that. Well, because the, the Garcia case, at first they try to not go through the arbitration, right? No, no, no but then sent to the arbitration. It. Yeah, and then it, it, was it went a wrong. Court. It was complete nonsense. Yeah. And then it went back to the judge, and didn't the judge give it a stamp of approval? Or what happened with that? Do you know? You mean at the end of it, unless the Supreme Court takes it, right? Yeah. Um, well, the judge found, the, well, the, the judges, because they, they appealed it, um, and it was ruled on by the Court of Appeal. Um, so in, on appeal, you have three judges, right? So um, they, it was appealed, um, and eventually the judges found that it was not, um, that the arbitration procedure was not problematic. So they so they try to go to court at first, right? Then they get sent back to arbitration because that's the nature of it. Then the arbitration happens, right? With all sorts of interesting stuff, right? Like they um, decided they couldn't have a lawyer. They decided their um, evidence was and theta. They decided they couldn't talk sometimes. Um, and also, it turned out that that um, arbitration procedure had never been applied. Um, it never had to be applied, even though everyone signs the contract, right? Never had to be applied. Um, it, and then you go to court after that, right? That's the mechanism. So it, it, you have to go there first. Then you go to court and you can have that reviewed. But the grounds are limited because it's arbitration. That's the whole point, right? You have people agree um, in lots of contexts. It's, generally, it's a commercial context, right? But, but people realize that um, the court system is long, public, expensive, and problematic in all sorts of ways. So they agree to arbitration. Well, same thing there, right? And the whole point is that the court then respects that. Because if you have arbitration, and then you get to go before a court and have it done over, it defeats the entire purpose of arbitration, which is to have it not done by a court for cheaper, more effectively. So once you go to court after that, the grounds are very limited. Right. So you have to have, right, for example, like obvious bias or very serious procedural fairness problems or issues of jurisdiction. Right. J they just decided on stuff that they couldn't. Um, and so eventually the judges found that that did not happen, that the, the, the procedure wasn't sufficiently biased or um, or problematic and therefore that the arbitration was valid, even though it was. Now, I mean, they, they did find that it was, it's, it's kind of complicated, but they did find that, it, find that it was biased, but they found that that's the nature of it, right? That when you sign a clause that says the person who will decide your, your case is an arbitrator, when you sign a clause that says this person will be a member of the church, um, and if you know anything about Scientology, you know if they um, say anything wrong, they'll get declared. Um, well, the nature of it means that the system is, quote unquote, inherently biased. And so they found that that was a main, I think, argument, right, um, that it, it, it didn't breach the, the, the bias or the procedural fairness rules, because inherently, that's what you agreed to. Yeah, see, all of that basically sounds like, sorry, but you're fucked, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. And this is called fair and legal justice. And it's total bullshit, man. It's total bullshit. Like Luis Garcia did not deserve what happened to him. And the years of work he has tried to do to fight back against that has resulted in a justice system that is basically giving him the finger. And I just For other people don't as well, right? Because I don't that think he fought that legit. for himself. Yeah. What's that? For other people as well, because I don't think he fought that for himself. I'm sure it cost him not that much short of what he was claiming um, over the years. I don't understand what you just said. He was fighting for other people to be able to bring claims as well, I yes, think, and exactly. for the arbitration to be valid. Because it, it right. he was the first. Cost him. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And with the court siding with Scientology's obvious kangaroo court i mean i gotta tell you man this really pisses me off right i'm not pissed at you of course you're, you're just telling me what's what 
I'm just, I'm pissed because this man got, he, he got, he, he got stepped on by our system trying to show that Scientology is a corrupt, fraudulent organization that took money from him by lying to him. Even when he was a passionate, diehard Scientologist, he was lied to repeatedly for money, and he shows this to the courts, and they're like, yeah, too bad. Oh, and you went back and you did the arbitration? Well, guess what? It's inherently biased anyway, so sorry. I mean... There is no justice there. So what I my question to you as a law professor is, what are we supposed to think about that, watching that play out? Was it bad lawyering? Is the system just, it, just endlessly corrupt? What is going on here that a blatantly fraudulent act on the part of the Church of Scientology cannot get any justice? What are, what are we supposed to think? Right. About that? Well, I think there's a lot of things there, but first, right, like there's a there's an arbitration clause. Right? Like they signed a contract. If they didn't, none of that would be a problem. So yeah. it's all because of the contract there. Right. Um, additionally, it's the nature which is unusual. Most religions don't have religious arbitration, they don't have contracts at all, right? Right, um, right. With their members. Right. Very unusual. Um, and it's the nature of the framework that we're using because arbitration is that, right? As I said, like the whole point is that you agree not to subject yourself to the court system, which can be a very good thing because it's expensive, it's, it's long, it's, um, it, 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 the, the nature of it is that, right, you are very well protected in your rights, um, but it costs a lot of money. Um, and that can mean that, right, your rights are not actually protected because it costs you too much money. So arbitration can be good in, in getting you away from that. Um, and again, the whole point is that if you have a court, then do it over. That means that the wealthier party will systematically do that and you're defeating the entire purpose because you're having it done over by a court, which has the same time and cost that you otherwise have. Mm. So Scientology, very unusual, right? It uses that to its benefit. It uses religious arbitration, which is very unusual. And ultimately, it's a framework that comes from very good things, which is not to sub subject yourself to the court system. Mm. Then I think there are certainly questions. First, there are limits to that. Right, like, and 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 damages for rape that has very little to do with a religion might very well be a, a clear limit to that. Right, mm -hmm. um, at least it's what I would, at the end of the day, kind of expect one way or the other, because um, it's got nothing to do with that. Right, like you you can say there is a so the Garcias, right, like they they paid for stuff. Then the the there was a, a policy that says you get a refund. Essentially, right, like you. There's a policy that says you get a refund, but then when they declare you, you don't get to be before the person that gives you your money back. So that means you don't get your money back. So, right, that is a that can be a religious contractual policy issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, then if they defraud you, it's kind of different, right? Like because they it it's not the rules. They that you're you're saying they lied to me to take some more of my money, which right. has nothing to do with. So that's different, right? It's not and the same. And that's why I thought that the Luis Garcia case had legs because it was separate from the belief set. It wasn't about, yeah. I believed this thing and they took my money. It was, they told me something that was patently, blatantly, bald-faced, untrue. And I yeah. gave them my money because they told me that. And I still can't get any justice. Yeah, but it's about the contract, right? The contract right. can say that. Right. Um, and it can say that it covers the entirety of the relationship, right? Now, and, and again, it's the contract, but rape gets to be different now because it's on top of being a non kind of contractual thing. On top of that, it doesn't really even have anything to do with the religion, right? Um, it's right. a religious member. Um, so, yeah, there are limits to it that certainly will um, at some point um, apply. Um, but the, it's the nature of the contract. It's the fact that you're relying on arbitration as a mechanism, which 
is usually meant for courts not to intervene. So it, it doesn't mean that any other religion that doesn't have a contract wouldn't be in that position. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's issues as to, which are not as prominent in the United States, but we have that in other countries, um, the nature of the arbitration, right? A recognition that arbitration can be good and consensual in these ways if it's between two um, you know, rich and, and sophisticated companies, but that if it's between, for example, employer and employee, it's not the same thing because there is no ability to either understand the piece of paper you're signing or negotiate it, right? If you have a 10-page work contract um, and clause number five says you cannot sue your employer, um, it's very unlikely first that you would understand what that means, mm -hmm. then that you would find that it's a problem and call up your employer and say, I don't like clause number five. And then on top of that, it's very unlikely given your position as a, a potential employee, right, in a minimum wage job that you would successfully convince your employer, right, saying I will, and that's kind of the theory of it, right, I will withdraw my labor from you if you don't change clause number five. So there's an argument to be made as to how you interpret these clauses, which in the United States, for a bunch of reasons, um, courts are less open to, but th that exists in other countries. And then saying that when there's a power imbalance, you cannot interpret the clause in the same way or assume that it's valid in the same way. And you could argue that when you have a large uh, wealthy religion and a regular person, that you have that kind of power imbalance, and also that they has to agree to it, right? Because yeah. if they don't sign a contract, they don't get to come in. Obviously, no one's forced to let them in. That's the whole point, right? There's lots of people who'd want to be Catholics, but the Catholic Church doesn't want them. Um, but it, there is a non-consensual kind of element to it if you have to sign the contract. So first, it, it is unfair, but it's the contract, right? Not the religious protections directly. And then there are limits to that, which courts will interpret. It doesn't mean the Masterson case will, will play out the same way. Um, and then there's other things like the stuff I said about the power of balance, which is where some courts have, have put a limit to these right. arbitration clauses, but it's more unusual in the United States. Yeah, I haven't been impressed at all by the papers and stuff I've read about arbitration and religious arbitration specifically and how um how it's used i get your argument i get your point about the fact that there are there's and you've stressed and and taken the time to stress that there's a good side to this that these things are are put together to help us not hurt us that they are not inherently negative or or wrong but the way that they are used and we find with destructive cults that they're that they're aptly named because destruction is their product i mean it, and this is a perfect example i mean i think all I can really come to at the end of the line here with this is that we have this kind of endless line of logic as to why all of this is happening, but it really all falls down at the very beginning when the thing that destructive cults take advantage of every single time, this is a, this is a blanket universally true statement, Every one of them gets you on the fact that you are entering into this group, entering into these agreements, entering into this culture with a lack of informed consent. You do not know what you are getting into when you sign up with these groups. And that's the number one thing that they take advantage of because it's assumed by the courts and by the systems that you did. It's on you to know before you go, in other words. And legally, that makes sense. But practically speaking, it's just nonsense. People aren't like that. So that tends to be, what do you think of my of that? Well, I, that, all of that is very unusual, right? Like, yeah. very, very, very unusual. I don't think anyone would have thought that, um, not that that changes any of what I said, right? But I don't think anyone would have thought that you have a religion that would have, um, you know, most of its important stuff to be in confidential scripture right. um, that they would try to fight for the confidentiality of their stuff based on intellectual property tools that um, have never really had been applied in that context. 
I don't think anyone would have thought that you'd have a religion systematically get people to sign contracts um, that would subject them to, this is all completely uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's just odd. Um, right. And so it, it, it's somewhat hard to deal with because there's no um, precedent for it. Um, and these are tools that do exist in the legal system um, right. that can be used voluntarily, right? Like, it's, it, 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 yes, you can have a religion charge royalties on books, sure, right? Like, why not? It's the nature of a book. You, you, you invented the stuff, so you get paid for it, right? The Bible is free because it's been 2,000 years, and there's a limited number of years for which you can get royalty right yeah um, jesus ain't getting his but, royalty but it's not anymore. usually used and the same thing for arbitration right um i don't think anyone would have thought it would be um used as aggressively in that context um right it, so it, most people don't sign contracts with the religion breaking in terms of its legal tools <laughs> And, and they use everything that's available, right? That's the, right. the interesting stuff. They have their own, their own system and their own rules, um, and they think that it's freestanding, right? Like that, that's why they've got a boat. That's why he tried to, to get, um, I think it was an island or a country, right, for himself. Um, it's because they think it, it's comprehensive and freestanding, yeah. um, but they still use when, the, when there is one, the regular legal system and its tools um, to their benefit in a way that's very, you know, creative and, and sophisticated. Okay, well, let me, let me ask you, let me, read, let, me, let me step back for a second now and ask you again this question earlier, because we went off on the civil tangent and went down the, the arbitration route there. And I appreciate all your comments on that. And it is and it is unfortunate and uh, difficult to deal with the, you know, with the with the, the, the situation the way that it stands right now. But I get it. What do you where what do you see? Have you have you been keeping up? Let me ask you this. Have you been keeping up with um, Tony Ortega's reporting on the Danny Masterson criminal prosecution? No, not not closely okay all right then i won't ask you i know he was he was charged recently right somewhat recently i don't know what, what happened afterward the charges were confirmed right um yes I, I don't know the, the indictment happened, happened and the trial is set for august right there's not really been a whole lot of other reporting on it in terms of you know what's what's going to happen but there was some very interesting pre-trial stuff going on in terms of bringing scientology into it and that's what I wanted to know. You didn't you didn't see that stuff? No. Okay. All right. Well, maybe we'll take a look at that and regroup because I'd very much like to get your opinion on Scientology's legal exposure right now in regards to the cover-up uh, and the contribution of the Sea Org and Celebrity Center, right? And uh, potentially Miscavige, I mean, because he's the one who calls all the right. shots and stuff. I'm very interested in their legal exposure right now in this criminal case, not the civil stuff. And I'm right. interested in your take on that, but I need you to, to check sure. out. The, all well, the I mean, I'm familiar with the, the general issues of it, for sure, right? Like as to, certainly they'll have to, to disclose some stuff that they wouldn't want to disclose, right? Even if they're trying to claim confidential, it doesn't really work that way, right? Like when it's a crime, there's there's lots of protections for the person being accused, but, but the other person who's trying to with, withhold some stuff based on confidentiality is there's very limited protections for that because you want to be able to find out what the truth is. Right. Um, and, and certainly there's some, yeah, there, there's potentially some, as you mentioned, legal exposure. I'm not sure that anyone would want to um, do, use it. Um, but um, yeah, because you have right like if you charge an actual organization criminally you obviously can't put a company in jail right so you right. it stops existing if it's if it's right. sued criminally um so there's very and that's why most companies right in in all sorts of contexts settle for large amounts of money with the government is because if they're charged and, and convicted they um stop existing so i don't know that um the, the go governments will be very careful, not just about the, the objects of charging a religion, 
um, but, but also the potential consequences of that. Um, well, let me ask you this. I mean, theoretically speaking, we spent most of the beginning of this podcast talking about how exempt religions are from a whole lot of prosecution having to deal with their religious beliefs and the practice thereof, right? And this has afforded a great deal of attitude and protection because we want to preserve this concept of freedom of religion. But when you have a church member, whether it's a Catholic or a Scientologist, rape a number of women, and the organization of the church, individuals in the church, not the whole church as a whole, but individuals in that church, right? Ethics officers or MAAs or case supervisors or auditors or David Miscavige as an individual. If it can be shown through paper trails or reports or things like that, that these individuals were aware of and helped cover up that crime, those criminal activities, would they be individually liable rather than trying to take on Scientology as an organization? Oh yeah, for sure. That, that these are separate crimes, right? Like right. It, 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 there's the crime itself, but there's also the crime of, um, you know, trying to commit a crime. There's the crime of helping someone commit or try to commit a crime, and then mm -hmm. there's the crime of trying to help someone get away with having committed a crime. These are all separate crimes. For and and, and the individual people, that's that's not. It, it, it it's not as complicated if you if you try to charge individual people it's not necessarily um as complicated it's just at some point if there's a an organizational component to it right if it's because of rules or because of executives that are directing other people mm -hmm. or because of a if if in some way the behavior is more easily ascribed to the organization that you can still sue the people individually mm -hmm. but you can also sue the organization whatever it is it could be company or religion okay um, and, and, and when, that's where the, the there's more reluctance okay and but you, that's also possible that's the nature of it right mm -hmm. um if if people it, it happens all the time right people can commit crimes for the benefit of the company they're working for, financially or otherwise, mm -hmm. um, and if that's the case, they are the the, the organization itself can be um, it can be subject to prosecution. Okay, okay. So now the and that's the that's the claim, right? Like if right. they're acting, the, the systematic stuff is not all that convincing, right? Just saying they're all a bunch of criminals in Scientology, so it's Scientology, not the most convincing legal argument, I think. But right. if you're saying it's because of policy or it's because of the interpretation of policy that comes from whoever, right? David Miscavige, the International Justice Chief, and they send it down as, a, as an executive or organizational order, then there's a claim to be made that it's, these people are acting on behalf of the organization or that the organization takes on their actions. Right. Okay. Okay. But while there were enough people involved, I can guarantee you there were enough people involved that it's going to be a small little army. I mean, there's the, the number of people yeah. who are connected with celebrities are not huge, but that's not small either. I mean, we look at Laura D. Crescenzo as an example, over 200 people had access to her PC folders over the years. I think it may be even, I think it was hundreds, right? Uh, oh yeah, they're not confidential. No, there's <laughs> nothing confidential going it's, on. It, it it gets extremely scary, but yeah. Like, yeah, um, yeah. There's there's hundreds of people literally opening those folders and looking into them anytime they want. <laughs> now the celebrity folders are a little bit different, right? And this Masterson case was absolutely going to be covered up in the within the church inside the church. Very few people were going to know about this, but. It's not just a couple. I mean, when we talk about the whole command line, you're talking about the president's office, you're talking about the Office of Special Affairs, you're talking about whoever other, whatever other ethics officers were involved, and of course, going up the line to David Miscavige and anybody in management who might have overheard or had something to do with this as well. So that's at least, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb and say that's at least 20 to 30 people who would have known right. something about this case from the beginning or somewhere along the line. Yeah. 
if that's the case, right, then I do think you have an argument to be made, but you'd have to have a paper trail and you got to show all this because Scientology is absolutely positively not going to cooperate in any way, shape or form with providing evidence to show this. But it's all there. Yeah. It's all there. And they do. Any- like they, they, Scientology is pretty good at, at writing down everything for yeah. one, right? Real good. Um, and it also seems to be policy based. Right, like, because it's the actual, and again, that's not protected. Usually, it's protected, but if it's a crime, it's not. Right, okay. um, and the policy says you don't get to engage with the regular court system or call the police, whatever it is. Right, the policy says that. Right. So it it it's not it's it's a bit harder than to claim that it's just individual people who went rogue. Um, right. It, there, there's an organizational component to it if they're applying either guidance but from from management or policy but in, in that case it's also policy right the policy says you um you don't get to to engage with the authority it says it's a it's an actual violation that you can be punished for pretty severely if you do um and ostensibly right these these people were applying that um they weren't just acting on their own behalf they were applying the rules that say that. Um, That's right. That's right. Well, especially when you have things like, you know, I mean, I don't know how, how, you know, gotcha, this is in the court of law, but certainly I can tell you culturally in the Sea Org, right? The number one point, number one of the code of a Sea Org member is I promise to uphold forward and carry out command intention. And that's not a vague concept. That is exactly what, what David Miscavige wants. That's what you are doing, you know? Uh, it's not some vague, oh, all these policies and all these lectures, and that's command intention. No, it's what orders do you have from David Miscavige? That's what you do, right? That's your life. And if you do not do right. those things. Now, I doubt that the Danny Masterson trial is going to have all of this come out. But I wonder, I hope, I you know, could it? Is it possible? Is, you know, how does... How open are these cases when you're dealing with something like, you know, serial rape where you have a number of victims over a period of time and you have an organization, even if it's a church, actively helping to cover this up? How how open is the, you know, how how much leeway does the prosecution have to pursue that, to depose people, to to bring stuff in or is deposing even part of this process? I don't even know with criminal law. Like how how do they do discovery and how much how you know it does it can the prosecutor get PC folders ethics files if they ask for them stuff like that right so they would I, I mean it's it's they they could for sure um, and and certainly it's a very very um, it puts them in a in a vulnerable position. It's it's nothing like the the Headleys or the Garcias. It's it's a, a much more. It, it creates a lot more vulnerability, and I think they are very concerned about that. Mm. Um, the risks for okay. sure. Um, and that is, but you know they're not they're not dumb, right? Or they're not dumb anymore. They won't <laughs> try to intimidate prosecutors, right? Like the IRS maybe, but but prosecutors probably not a good idea. Yeah. Right um, now, there, there's issues as to the relevance of it because now they're charging the guy, right? So the the whole uh, you know cover up or whatever you want to call it might not be directly relevant to that. Um, so they will, and, and but certainly they'll be able to get whatever they want, um, at least from the defense standpoint. If whatever they think can help them disprove the crime they'll be able to get one way or the other doesn't mean it'll be public doesn't mean it'll be easy but they you know the the, the leeway is pretty broad um and right. all of the 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 scientology portion of it might not be relevant um to that so it would depend more on um how they then choose to handle further potential um criminal accusations right so if they choose to charge other people and or the organization which again is is very much possible but not likely because it looks very bad um especially if it's a religion and it's got all the consequences we mentioned but 
Mm. Um, if they chose to do that, then all of that would be, it, and it's very much possible. It's just, it's just a a that's the nature of the job of, of a prosecutor, right? Like the, it's not just to decide if a crime has been committed. It's, it's it's whether it makes sense to do something, right? Like if you have someone, uh, you know, hit someone once, is it is it in the public interest to to put them in jail and then they, you know, hang out with all sorts of people who they shouldn't hang out with and then they lose their job when they're out they have a criminal record they don't get a job and then you know they 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 live a life of crime so that's not usually something we think that's beneficial so the, the part of the job is deciding whether it's in the public interest to do that so right. um the prosecutors will decide if if it's a good idea even if it might be legally sustainable to charge other people and or the organization um, but if they do, all of that would be directly relevant, useful, and used. Maybe not in the, the Masterson case itself, because it's not all relevant, right? It's it's not all relevant to, to seeing. You know, certainly if there is evidence that he committed rape, um, sexual assault, I shouldn't say rape, um, that he committed sexual assault, um, and that evidence is hiding somewhere within the church, they'll try to get it. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean they'll be able to use it. But that that would be kind of the extent, because, because there is rules about that, right? When they, even if you say you've committed a crime, there's rules as to how you can use it, because people have a right not to incriminate themselves, right? And if they say that before they know that someone is accusing them of a crime, then it doesn't count as them, because they, they weren't told that they were accused and could shut up. So it, it, it's usually not admissible. Um, but that would be the extent of its of its relevance, right? The, the cover up would not be directly relevant otherwise. I gotta, I gotta stop you for a second. Something you just said sure. confused me. Are you telling me that if Danny Masterson walked into the celebrity center the day after he committed sexual assault on someone, allegedly, and said to the ethics officer, Yeah, I I, you know, without consent, I I forced myself on this woman last night that because she hasn't brought charges yet that admission is not is doesn't it doesn't mean anything usually yes that's how it works really the, the constitution says you have a right not to i mean the reasons for it the underlying reasons are pretty complicated and important but the constitution says you don't get to you don't have to incriminate yourself right because they could um you know for example they want to charge you with something if if, if say there's a let's backtrack a little bit say there's a civil case right yeah. um on anything then anyone can send you what we call a subpoena which means they force you to show up and then they ask you questions and you have to answer the questions that's just how it works it's an order of the court right like yeah. i can sign these as a lawyer i can force someone to show up before the court and then they don't get to say i won't answer your questions right unless there there's very few exceptions but Generally, that's how it works. It doesn't work that way in a criminal case because people have a right not to incriminate themselves, um, which exists for very important reasons, right? Um, among other things that people tend to admit to stuff they haven't actually done. And we really want to make sure if we're going to do something as serious as put someone in a cage that they 100% did it um, because otherwise, as a society, it's something we really don't like. Um, and because people tend to incriminate themselves, among other things. So you can't do that in a criminal case. You can't force someone to answer a question um, if they're accused and they don't want to. And it's kind of the same idea. The, that, that's, that's what it means not to, that you have an, a right not to incriminate yourself. So it's the same thing. If, if before um, answering, before knowing that you're being accused of something, you tell someone you did it, um, you didn't know that you would be accused and you weren't told that you had a right not to incriminate yourself. So usually it's not admissible in that context. And it might even be that you said it, you could have said it before a civil court in the context I just explained where they force you to answer a question. Um, and even if you did that, they probably couldn't use it in the criminal case because there you have a right not to incriminate yourself. That is fascinating to me. I can't say and, that, and that makes the nature of a sexual assault harder to prove, right? Of course, because there's no well, it's total witnesses, the there's exactly. no external evidence. So, uh, yeah, I mean, nobody else was in the room. So, if the yeah. guy 
literally goes and confesses after the fact or okay okay but it's a different well i mean the idea is if he knew someone was trying to send him to jail he wouldn't have confessed right yeah, no, that's kind of the although, idea although in the context of scientology he would have confessed no matter what yeah but because he had to it's kind of like it, right we were before court yeah it, exactly but now the prosecution on the other hand has reports or could get their hands on written reports, PC folders, ethics files, interviews after the fact of these women saying they wanted to go to the police and say, you know, cause that, that, it, and it took a while for these women to even find out about each other, much less, you know, the, I mean, it was years of Scientology suppressing this. And you're saying that because they didn't go to the police yet or make a formal accusation, all of those years of Scientology suppressing that evidence is no big deal. They just get to get away with that because no crime was being reported yet. Is that? Well, is, I mean, that doesn't mean that. Here? Well, Scientology did something. So I'm saying the admissions that might exist yeah. are not admissible against him. Okay. And even after he's charged, it, it might not even work if, 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 if it's admitted outside of court. Anyway, but okay. it, yeah, against him, Scientology still tried to, in, 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 hypothetically or allegedly, tried to, to cover up, quote unquote, that's not the word for it, but cover up a crime, which is a separate crime. That is a problem in itself, right? Okay. Like, you don't have to have charges or, or know about it for it to be a problem for Scientology. Um, we, we were saying the, the nature of what he said to an auditor mm -hmm. is not admissible as proof that he did what he said he did. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean that the other people committing other crimes, namely trying to hide it, um, are not themselves vulnerable. Okay. Um, so okay. The, the suppression is, if they're hiding evidence, there's ways to get the evidence at the end of the day, you know, whether it's admissible or not, it's a different story, but there's ways to get it, right? If, if, okay. if they hit it, it can be found. Um, and yeah. the hiding is a problem in itself as well. Well, very much so, because it, it doesn't make any damn sense to me that, you know, he could be called into an ethics interview, say a year after the fact, tell an ethics officer everything, and yeah, nope, sorry, we don't get to use any of that. Like, that doesn't make any damn sense to me because that ethics interview is not going to be yeah by the way i just happened to it's what happened when did it happen how did it happen exactly what did you do exactly right. what was said right i mean everything is going to be documented and that is i'm 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 a thousand percent sure that evidence exists there's oh, well, no way, so am I. There's yeah, no way it doesn't exist so I just wanted to be clear about what and, and he probably usable. recounted it many times with many auditors at many yeah for sure yeah that's the nature of it yeah so all of that would be inadmissible in a courtroom most likely yeah as as proof that he did what he said he did doesn't mean that other people didn't commit crimes but most likely it would be. That makes no And it's the same, it's the same man. idea, right? Like first he didn't know what he was getting into. He didn't know that, that that would be used against him to put him in jail. And it's also not fully voluntary, right? It's kind of like if someone forces you to answer, it's kind of the same thing there, right? He he said it because he had to in auditing man. talk about it. I get the I get the principle, but the execution sucks. Yeah. It really does. There's something seriously wrong with that. You know, there really is. Well, that's I, the I, nature I, of it as well, right? Like yeah. the nature of that. It's important because we really don't want to put innocent people in cages, um, right. and and because people confess to stuff that they didn't do. But the direct consequence of that is that there are people who did commit crimes who don't get punished for them all the time. That's the societal choice that we make. It's it's not a a you're saying it sucks. It's 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 a an, an accepted consequence of it that 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 principle 
inherently means that people commit crimes and don't get punished. Right. Quite a bit of the time. Yeah. I mean, the other side of that might be helpful as well, right? Like if if the if the might or might not be, but if the 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 victims, right, have contemporaneously given their story, that can be helpful if it's if it's consistent. If it's inconsistent, that's it's not going to be helpful. Um, it's going to be very detrimental. But if they gave their diversion consistently and early on, that can be useful in 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 showing that they're telling the truth right it's it's right. admissible for their benefit um to put it that way okay okay how interesting well i certainly hope i have a high degree of hope that despite these barriers and i i don't know i mean my my reality meter right now is kind of like well good luck but I certainly hope that Scientology at organizationally and individual Sea Org members who are personally responsible for covering up sexual assault, and they are, um, I truly hope that somehow, despite all this nonsense, uh, that the truth can come out in such a way that these people can be punished for the crimes they committed. I really do. And, I, and, and nothing you've said so far is really giving me a whole lot of hope in that. And I and I have to say that's very disappointing to me. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, I think it's going to have I mean, an impact regardless, right? Well, first, it doesn't mean that they they can sue civilly, right? Like they can get money. Yeah, but that's, that, that's going the whole arbitration route, man. That's no solution for these women. There's no. Well, we'll see if it does. I'm not regard. sure it will. It might, but I'm not sure it will. Yeah. Um, and people do get convicted for sexual assault, especially when it's a a pattern of uh, at some point, right? If yeah. I, I, people I have do get convicted of confidence that Masterson's thing. going to jail. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I do have that. I right. think Scientologists, right. Sea Org members, also to go to jail right. who, yeah. who are involved in this. You know. Yeah, you're you're probably right, but I think regardless, it's going to have, I, and and also because it it just looks bad, right? These are people who are prosecutors or in some way, you know, representative of the government, right? And 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 sometimes policy positions as well. So it it, it might not look good or, or be in, in the interest of uh, society as they assess it to, to sue um, criminally for that. But certainly I think regardless, it's going to have an impact, right? And we saw that with Scientology. They, they've changed their practices over time, right? Including the harassment, including the you know some of the stuff they used to do right they they, they don't yeah. try to frame people for crimes anymore they don't harass people as much right um and yeah, it's the same I thing there so i'm sure that the practices so have already changed yeah some things have changed i i don't know about setting people up for crimes i don't know that that has changed but certainly the rpf is no longer around and we can take we can pat ourselves on the back on that one um because that was, there's no reason for David Miscavige to have gotten rid of that except for the massive right. exposure, right? Yeah. Massive. So, so sure, for sure, I don't mean to, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm trying to like, you know, be upbeat here, but it's just, God damn, man, this is very frustrating. This is very frustrating. And this is all just from the side commentary. I don't even know what the prosecutors and the, and the poor women involved in this thing, who for 20 right. years now, Oh, this is coming up on 20 years going back to the first incident. I think it was 2003 or four or something around there. I, I didn't realize that. Um, yeah, this has been going on for a long time for these women. Ugh. Yeah. It's bad. Ugh. Well, I, like I said, I have a high degree of confidence that Masterson's going to, I mean, multiple accusers, the stories are consistent, the data is there. Uh, you know, Scientology's connection with it. I've got my fingers crossed. We'll see what the prosecutors do. It's no way to know until the trial starts, though, I suppose. Right. As far as their strategy and stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. And he's got a good lawyer. Yes, he does. He has a whole dream team of lawyers. He's got one of OJ's lawyers. Yeah. How do people do that, by the way? Do what the the job or Scientology. getting the lawyer? Def defend murderers, defend Scientology. I don't. I don't get it. I've never been able to get it. 
that's a loaded question. I think. I think there's. A, <laughs> I think they, I they do feel some <laughs> compassion for. I think human beings are complex, and 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 people make mistakes, including very very serious mistakes. Um, and I think there's when you get to know the person, you can feel compassion for um, the rest of their identity um, that's not tied to very bad things that they've done. Um, and I also think that they care about the system. It, when, be, the stuff I mentioned, right? Like when you know that people have been, you know, wrongfully imprisoned um, in a developed country and you know that um, people have confessed the stuff they haven't done, which happens somewhat often, um, then you feel a moral imperative to, to fight every single time to make sure that as a whole, the system doesn't allow that to happen. Right, right. I, I can do it myself, but I, I, I understand how they um, get, get, feel that their work within the system is overall positive and important. Yeah, I, 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 the only way that I make sense of it for myself is to consider is to think about them the same way I think about um, new religious movement scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have a bunch of uh, people, who, some of whom are actually really well intentioned people, you know what I mean? It's not a group of nefarious, awful, horrible, evil minded people. It's it's people who think they're defending freedom of religion, think they're defending freedom of, you know, uh, belief and all that. And so they defend Scientology and they are just then they just don't take the time to really understand what they're talking about. And so they don't know what they're talking about, but they're standing on a principle and damn it, that principle is important. And so my life has meaning. And I just shake my head at the at the silliness of it. But it's but I get it. I get I get the principled positions, you know. Still, <laughs> still. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, th I, I think we're going to move toward wrapping up because I've asked you about most of what I wanted to ask you about. And, um, and I get it. I get it. It's complicated. It's, it's difficult. It is, uh, it's convoluted, you know, the legal system and the, and the, yeah. The balance of rights versus responsibilities that that we have as citizens, and 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 you don't want to get railroaded. You don't want to be in a position where injustice is committed to you because you didn't really do anything wrong. And so we have all these rules, but at the same time, it it, it works to protect abusers and manipulators and 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 L. Ron Hubbard types. And then yeah. just it's just never good news when that happens, you know. And it it does. Yeah, I guess that what I might have emphasized is that it's a, it's not an accident. It's it's something that we accept as as being worth it. Um, I, but I'm no. sure from the perspective, I, I, I don't of, accept that. So that's right. I, I actually disagree with you right there. I just go, no, that's not acceptable. It's yeah. not right. It's not okay. And, and you lost a lot of your yeah. life to that, yeah. right? Like exactly. Years and years of, <laughs> which certainly makes it more. Yeah. Personally, and, and yeah, yeah, I'm a little bit more passionate about it. But I get it. I get that 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 I. I mean, I I have enough self awareness to know that I am not unbiased and objective in this matter. I get that. Right. But it is frustrating to be victimized, to watch others be victimized, and to then think that. I'm supposed to chalk that up to, well, it's just a collateral damage of our rights. Right. No, no, I'm sorry, but I'm just not going to go there. And I get why you do. And I get why you would say that, but I don't, I, I'm not right. going to agree with that, you know? So whatever is what it is. <laughs> Thank you very much, Phil, though, for your time and for taking- Happy to. Yeah, I really do appreciate it. Uh, you know, it's not all good news, but it is what it is. And it is reality. And so we got to deal with that. I just want to stress, I guess, in wrapping this podcast up, that, uh, that all of this is really why it is not easy. It's no walk in the park to go after these cults. It's no walk in the park to go after abusers and manipulators and narcissists and predators. 
because right. these systems exist and these systems are difficult and complicated. Even when everyone agrees that something is exactly. bad. Um, right. And certainly there's lots of yeah, well-intentioned people grappling with very complex issues that That's have right. much broader consequences than we might at first see. Exactly. I, I do get that. I do get that. And I guess I just wanted to, um, you know, it's always frustrating for me to enter into the legal arena. It's been that way for years. You're not the first lawyer I've talked to that I've been like, God damn it. But, you know, I mean, it's like, it's like, ah, um, cause in that, cause in this context, it's so clear. Right. And I know that there are 50 other contexts in which it's not so clear. And I get that. But when it is so clear, then you cannot help but feel the system is letting you down, you know? Sure. And, yeah. that's and at the end of the day, it's the result that you see. And that yeah. matters, certainly, to the people who are involved, not the, the rules or the context. That's right. That's exactly right. But it really does put a magnifying glass on why it is that Scientology wins again and again and again and again and again in the court system. And why, you know, taking them down legally is probably not the best route. I don't want it to come across as a blame the victim approach. I'm, I'm very hesitant to say this even because I think it might be taken that way, but I don't mean it this way at all. When I say it really is in our best interest to know before we go and not sign the contracts and not enter into the dumbass agreements and not join these groups in the first place. You know, if I'm going to get passionate about something, it's really going to be on the on that end of it, because all of this complication and, and nonsense and, and legal rigmarole and stuff that people have to experience is all because they didn't take the time to find out what they were getting into before they got into it. You know, and I don't mean that as a blame the victim thing. It's like you're victimized. You should have justice for that. But, but really, the focus of our efforts needs to be to get people to not do it in the first place. Because once they do, these groups have their way with them, you know, uh, because of the way they manipulate these systems to their advantage. Right. Yeah. And certainly it, it's, yeah, I, I hope I stress that it's not because the legal system agrees with the substance of what Scientology does. And it's also not because they're, they're wealthy or they have good lawyers. I think it's a lot more complicated than that when you have religion involved. Um, and I also think what you just said is, is true, right? Like now there's lots of information that people, I, I don't think anyone gets into Scientology does a, a, a you know, personality test or the communications course. And it's, it's gets into it without ever looking at the other side of it. I, I don't think that happens a lot anymore. Yeah. Um, and that's how, you know, free societies work. There, there isn't just the law. There's, there's people who fight over um, ideas and you can't kill ideas and you probably shouldn't, but certainly you can, um, you know, make them less influential um, on the substance. That's right. That's right. Well, it's 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 a it's a it, it really does come down to okay. Well, look, you're not responsible for every single thing that happens to you, especially every single bad thing that happens to you. That's not true, but it is true that by demonstrating more effort to be responsible, <laughs> we can perhaps <laughs> uh, keep ourselves from being victimized as often as we are. If we just take that time, if we just remember to curb those emotions and, and think more rationally in the moment when it comes to these important decisions, um, you know, and if we are well grounded in, for me, the, the real convincer, the real, the, the real trick is grounding people enough in how susceptible they are to being manipulated and giving them some idea of how that happens so that they can at least have a red flag go up when it's happening to them in real time. Right. You know, and, I, and it seems to me that, that 
all the effort to to clean up the spilled milk, I guess we could say, right, is is so much effort and there's no guarantee you're going to get it all up. Don't spill it in the first place. <laughs> it's right. really the easier solution here, maybe, you know. Yeah, and there's a lot more information and, and resources for people to do that. Yeah. yeah um, exactly. than, than there used to be. I think people, by and large, are, are taking advantage of that. Um, yeah, I think so, too. I think so, too. I think the Internet is, is I think that if, if there's any seriously positive angle or side to the, the information age and the distribution, the digital age that we live in now, it's, it is that that information is so much more easily accessible and it's right at your fingertips, guys. I mean, you really, really don't have the excuse anymore that you didn't know. Why didn't anybody tell me? You know, that, that excuse doesn't cut it anymore. <laughs> right. So anyway, all right, Phil. Well, listen, again, thank you very much for taking the time here. I, 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 I got to get something at the end of these shows to give me some uplift or I'm just, I'm just going to like, you know, I got to do something. So, so anyway, thank you very much for, for your contribution here today. I really, really did enjoy talking to you. Happy to anytime. All right. All right, folks. So uh, for my audience out there, thanks very much for uh, coming around and listening to this podcast this week. I hope I hope it was somewhat, you know, informative and educational and uh, perhaps in some degree uh, entertaining, you know, uh, at some points at least. <laughs> but um, but, you know, nothing set in stone. And and there are months still ahead of us before Masterson goes to trial and before may, hopefully Scientology itself goes on trial for the cover-up of, of what it engaged in with this uh, criminal case. And, I, and I'm and i really, really, really going to be watching this very, very closely. So um, so we'll see what happens. Uh, please do like and subscribe to the show and uh, share it around on the internet. All right, guys, I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.